softball, then you are going to love the Fast Pitch TV show. We're bringing you more interviews, more videos, and more product reviews than anyone else on the planet. Sit back and get ready. Here's the Fast Pitch TV show. Hello, I'm your host Gary Leland, and this is the Fast Pitch TV show. And this week's show features Coach Carol Brugerman from the University of Louisville. Carol gave the session Organizing Practices to produce game day results. Now she gave this clinic at Softball Con in Louisville, Kentucky, and they allowed me to film it for you. On this episode, I'm gonna bring you part two of her clinic. If you've not seen part one yet, you may wanna to go to fastpitch.tv and watch part one first, and then watch this episode. But before we go to part two of her clinic, I'd like to show you this short video for the magazine I publish. It's called The Fast Pitch Magazine. <laughs> That's just not your style, you're more stoic. You've got to run your practices like that. You've got to be that person at practice and be that person on game day. You cannot be two different people. Scream and yell at them on game day. They won't be like, who is this guy? Who's this lady? You have to be the same person. Um, I used to work for Carol Hutchins at Michigan and, and it was critical. We always talk about this. You can't have a recruiting personality and then a coaching personality. You can't recruit a player a certain way and be this person. I mean, you get them here, you know. You can't do that. They're, it's not going to work. Great, great story with Carol Hutchins. Uh, when I worked for her in the early to mid-90s, at that time there were seven Big Ten schools that had softball. Now there's, I don't know how many there are now, like 15. <laughs> but there's, there's a bunch. But there were seven at the time. And only... Um, let's have 64. 32 teams made the NCAA tournament. I mean, now we have almost 300 Division I softball teams. So we have 64 that make the tournament. Um, back then, we you know, maybe had 180 Division I softball teams. So it's, it definitely has grown in the last 15 to 20 years. But if you've ever met Carol Hutchins, which some of you probably have, and I had the pleasure of working for her, she is a very fun person. She is very outgoing. She has a very close relationship with her players. She can always put the hammer down, believe me, when she needs to. But that's her personality. She's, she's borderline goofy. You know, she's kind of that accident prone one and goofy one. If something's going to happen, it's going to happen to her. That's her. And she would tell you the same thing. And as we were going into what, what was my second to the last year there before I took over at Purdue, she said, we, we finished second place three years in a row. And back then, if you didn't win the Big Ten Conference, you didn't get one of the 32 automatics. I mean, there was just no... There wasn't enough teams, so if you didn't win your conference, you were not going, because everybody else at that time was in the Pac-10 that was going. So they filled up all the slots. And we finished second, 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 three years in a row. She said, that's it, I, we have to do something different. Okay, I'm a young coach at the time, she said, I, Gail Blevins at Iowa, who I also played for, Gail Blevins at Iowa, who, those of you who met her, complete opposite personalities, Carol Hutchins, Gail Blevins. Very successful coaches in every Hall of Fame there is won a lot of games. Gail Blevins is more serious, more stoic, not very, uh, you know, coaches or players in practice who doesn't want to be as involved with them off the field, but very effective coach. I, I got to be more like Gail. She's more serious. I'm too goofy. I, I, I get too involved with them. I'm too into them. I'm just, I'm going to be more like Gail. And I said, are you sure we want to do this? Yeah, we got to try something. And to her credit, I give her all the credit in the world for trying something. I mean, we were second forever. And it was very frustrating. They had, Michigan had never been in the NCAA tournament at that time. So, on paper, we had the best team we've ever had coming back. We had a lot of returners, a couple All-Americans at the time. And Hutch became kind of like Gail. You know, she didn't have time for him that much off the field. She was 
call them by their last name, you know, Jones, over there, whatever, over there. Very, very different. Well, can you imagine what happened? It was a nightmare. Hutch was miserable, because she wasn't herself. The team was like, who is this crazy lady? And, and how, do I, how do I even approach her now? And again, to Hutch's credit, she was trying something, because that's just who she is. She's a wonderful coach. But it was a nightmare. We finished the season 29 and 27, and 20 years later, it is still her worst record she's ever had in Michigan. We finished fourth in the Big Ten. It was a nightmare. Awful. And nobody was happy. So at the end of the season, we sat down. She's like, well, heck, we're going to lose. I'm at least going to be myself. You know, we, that didn't work. So she went back to being, you know, herself. And I will tell you on paper, we did not have a very good team. Not to mention their confidence was down. And I'll be darned. And this story really does have a happy ending. For the first time, we won the Big Ten. Our talent was nowhere near the year before. Nowhere near. And was that the only reason? Because we changed our personalities? No. But it was a big reason. And, and Hutch would tell you that same story today. You've got to be yourself. You've got to be yourself. And from that point on, that was 1993, they haven't missed an NCAA tournament since. They're always in the top 10. So uh, you've got to be yourself. Your team needs that. You need that to be successful. At practice, have a good mixture of routine and fresh. They kind of need to know what your everydays are or what your routines are. Which, by the way, routines are great, superstitions are not. Does anybody know why? Routines are great, superstitions are not. For all you psych majors in the room, what's the reason why? All you counselors? Which one can you control? The routines. You can control your routine. You can't always control your superstition. I always jump over the chalk line before I go on the field. What if they've painted the line? It's not chalk. I don't know, but you, you gotta be careful with that. Routines are good, but you gotta, gotta have a little bit of everything. Keep your practices creative. Keep them creative. Make each minute productive and squeeze the most out. We talked about this last night. We coach a sport where we do a few skills over and over and over and over. We have to do all those skills up there over and over and over. So we've got to make sure we're very good at those skills, especially throwing and catching, especially throwing and catching. 70% Division One World Series, they've done studies over the last five years. Uh, the majority of errors are throwing errors. Division One World Series, it's supposed to be pretty good players. Still, a lot of throwing errors. And I think you think about your team right now, you're like, yeah, that's probably true. Be flexible. We talked about this. Things are going to change. Yeah, you're gonna, the weather, beautiful sunny day, and it pours, right? Right at 3 o'clock for practice time. You ever had that happen? Happens to us all the time. So, you know, you got to be flexible. Uh, very important. We don't have a practice speed or a game speed. We just go hard. We just go hard. Once they get the skill down, you may have to slow down a skill, like catching or whatever it might be, but once they get it, it doesn't matter until you can go game speed. It doesn't matter. So we try to do everything at a very fast tempo. I would hope if you came to our practices, you would feel like it was a, it felt like a game, it's game tempo, which is very important. And if they get it right, you don't have to go as long as your practice plan says, right? You don't have to go that long. If they get it right, go on. They'll love you for it. Okay, I'm gonna pull this up. I want you to do this. Get out a piece of paper. We're gonna plan practice here. We're gonna plan a defensive practice. It's gonna take, this won't take long. Okay, here's some things. Okay, what I want you to do, there's, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There's 12 things up there. These are all the things you would want to cover before your first game on defense. Okay, first and thirds, short game skills, where to go with the ball. These are 12 things you would need to cover before your first game. What I want you to do is rank order them. What's the first thing you should teach on the first day of your practice? Let's say you've got three weeks before your first game. You're going to plan a defensive preseason practice here. You're going to plan, I've got three weeks between my first practice and my last practice before game day. What's the most important thing here we need to do on day one? And then once they learn what they did on day one, what can we do on day two or day three? How can we build up to what you think is the least important thing to be prepared for on game day? Okay? So just kind of look at those things a little bit. Hopefully you guys can see them over there. And... 
Write down what you think the first thing should be. The second thing should be, I'll give you about, just about five minutes. We're good shape. Huh? If you have any questions, let me know. And I hope you go back and use this. <coughs> Anybody need an outline while you're while the rest of the people are? Catch the ball at the base, base coverage. Then what? Where to go with the ball? Now the ball's hit. We've done the fundamentals of throwing and catching. We know the base coverage. So now, okay, uh, you know we've got a fly ball. Where do we go with it? We got a line drive. Where do we go with it? What's next? Where to go with the ball on extra base hits? So now we got a double. We got a triple. Where do we go? It's still just catching and throwing and base coverage. Really, when you think about it. Extra base hits are throwing and catching and covering a base. Okay? Now we're getting to the one you all want to do. Short game skills. Now we didn't hit the ball, we bunted it. What's the percentages in general, not a team that's notorious for bunting or notorious for hitting, but in general, do teams, do teams hit the ball more or bunt the ball more in general? In general. Hit! Hands down! Hands down, any game you play, the teams are going to hit the ball more than bunt the ball, unless you're playing a super special team, right? It's, 
So we got to do the hitting first, where to go with the ball, where to go with the ball, extra base. Now we can go into, okay, what happens if they don't swing and they actually bunt? Short game skills, okay? So short game skills, what's after that? Short game coverages. So now we've taught them how to feel a bunt, how to get your feet set up to one, to two, whatever it might be, how to flip throw, how to, now, how are we running our defense? And that comes into play what we talked about last night. If your pitcher's your best fielder, let her field all the bunts. If your pitcher has a bowl this big and all she can do is pitch and she can't do anything else, get her away from the bunts. Think about your team. Run your coverages based on your team. It will change from year to year. It will change. Okay, what's next? So now we've hit the ball, we've funded the ball. What else can happen on offense? Steals, steal coverage. Now we've got to talk about steal coverage. Now we've got to add that little thing, which moves right into first and thirds. Organized chaos, the first time you do it. First and thirds is really a throwing drill, period. You just got to think a little bit. Okay, so now we've got four left. So now we get a little more advanced. Now we've got our basics in. Okay, we got all our basic plays. If this happens, this happens. What's next? What else could happen? Anybody get that far? Set, set play variances. Okay, so now what happens, let's say you always have your shortstop cover second on the steal. Pretty common. Let's say now you've got a super fast runner at one, a super fast slapper at the plate, less than two outs. Maybe you want your second baseman to cover the steal. And so your shortstop can play in the hole. Set play variances. Okay, set play variances. What's next? Reads off the technique and abilities, exactly. So now the speed and direction of the ball. Normally with a runner one, ground ball shortstop, we're thinking two. Well, what if, again, we talked about this last night, what if the speed and the direction of the ball is a chopped, slow, spinny ball to her backhand side? You may have to go one. So we, now we're getting more advanced. Now we have to actually read the ball and play the game. It's not just a set thing. And the last two, second to the last one, how, exactly, how the defensive variables affect the game, so the score. If it's 0-0 in the seventh inning, and you're, you're on defense, and the home team's up to bat, you might want to move your corners closer to the lines, and your outfielders closer to the lines. Why? To protect the extra base hit a little more, right? So that can affect your defensive positioning. And what is the absolute last thing? <laughs> trick plays, very good. Which, you know, there's a place for trick plays, for sure. One of my favorite ones is uh, <laughs> Linda Wells. Everybody know Linda Wells in this room? Heard of the name? Yeah. She uh, she coached in Minnesota, coached at Arizona State. But she was a great catcher in her day. She's she's quite a bit older than I am as well. So she hasn't played for a long time. Coached for a long time. Coached at Arizona State, Minnesota. She was a catcher, and she wore a, a chest protector and a mask. No leg guards ever. She's like, why does a catcher need leg guards? I'm like, that's a tough chick. Okay, but she never wore them, never wore them. If you do it right, you should never need it. I'm like, well, good point, okay, okay. Never wore them. But she was a great blocker, great catcher, could call the game well, but she had a very average arm. And she would tell the story of how her, tra her best trick play was runner stealing, and she would come up to throw, and she's, you know, she just kind of got a feel. You know, if you're a catcher, you get a feel. And you can kind of see. There was no way she was gonna throw that runner out. She and her team had a deal. She would come up and she would lob the ball right to the shortstop between shortstop and second base. And the shortstop was like, mine, 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 I got it, I got it. What's the runner thinking? Oh my gosh, it was a pop fly. They turn around, they throw, they get her out. Or if nothing else, she at least scurries back to first and nothing happens. True story. Maybe you want to use it. Maybe you want to use it. Hey, practice planning. Last five minutes here. Practice planning. If you're going to do individual or group work, if you on outfield, do them at the beginning and then always end with your team stuff. It's always better to go parts to whole. Um, buckets, buckets, buckets. Best piece of advice I have for you with running efficient practice is put empty buckets all over the place. So if they catch a ball, they drop in the bucket. They catch a ball, they drop in the bucket. And then all you got to do is switch buckets out. We do never have to pick up balls, which is a complete waste of time in practice. Empty buckets. Get them all over your field. Um, Station work, I'm sure a lot of you do different stations with fitting and fielding. Obviously, it allows you more time for individual instruction and no one's standing around, which is very important. 
You can do serpents, stations, split, and field outfield, full team practices. So I want to show you a, a, a practice, not this one. Here we go. I want to show you a practice plan that's just our whole team. This is from this fall. Is that up there? Okay. So for instance, this was a real practice we did this fall. This is a practice plan. It's it's not there's more detail on another sheet of who, when, where, but this is a start. So we practiced that day at 2.30, warmed up, and we did an offensive circuit, which I did not have listed there, but the offensive circuit would entail, you know, maybe a 2-2 two -two count at this station, maybe a one-pitch drill at this station. You got 10 tries to do something and, you know, one pitch. Uh, maybe it was a T station, maybe a bunt station, whatever it might be. And then we warmed up with some, what I call quarterback drills or agilities, do throwing progression together, we did what I call multiples and in a rows. Multiples is when everybody on the field is doing something. So you have two hitters, left field's going four, tag play, catcher back to three, right center working together, going two, back to one, we're gonna throw. So all this is happening at the same time. Our freshmen, when we start doing multiples, at least one of them gets knocked in the rear end of the head at some point, because you have to know what's going on. And once you make your play, you gotta hustle out of the way because the ball's coming. So I've got a ton of multiples if anyone is, is interested in any of those. Um, maybe a ground ball to the pitcher, they're going two at the same time there's a bunt, first and third are going one, catcher's got a pass ball. So there's a lot going on. In a rows means they have to do it right in a row. Outfielders, you gotta have five throws home, not just one outfielder, the whole team, it's a team drill. Outfielders, five throws home, have to be on the money, have to be one hop, has to be catchable for our catcher. They have to do it in a row. So they get to four, they give up, we just keep going, keep going until we get it right. Maybe the infield has double play in a rows. Any ball in the middle infield, we're turning two up the middle. Any ground ball to the pitcher, first third, we're turning two, four to one. And away we go until we get 10 in a row. That looked good. And you can be as tough a judge or as nice a judge if you want. If they complete the play, but the first baseman was up here, maybe some days you count that, we would start over. So that depends on what you want. We do this a lot. I call it perfect 12 or five minutes. So you can see at the bottom, we've got some groups pre-planned. So the first group will go out. We always meet at the mound. We always meet at the mound because when, when nine girls are sitting there staring at each other, somebody's gonna say something. So we're already practicing who's gonna be our leaders. Like who's gonna say what and we gonna listen to and they hustle out. And each group has to do two relays and cuts, two rundowns, two steals, one pickoff. We do some tweeners in there too most days. They have to do all the fundamental team drills first. Once they look good, we start the clock at five minutes. I would recommend the first time you do it, put it at eight minutes. We get down to three and a half minutes by the end of the season. But on this day, we did it for five minutes. And we'll put runners on, and we just create situations. You probably do it the same way. But we have a clock going, so it presents a sense of urgency. If they can get 12 in a row, they're done before five minutes. If they can't get 12 in a row, not outs, just good plays. If they can't, then they're on the line and they, they run. They have spread. So, that's a great drill, a little more advanced drill, once you actually know what's going on with your team and your fundamentals. But again, you can be as harsh a judge or as good a judge as you want. If, if a right fielder misses a backup, you can start the whole thing over. If the third baseman should have been demanding the ball because the play was a three and she didn't say anything, you can start it over. So you create whatever pressure you want to create. And then we had this last team competition. It was an offensive one. Uh, we let them hit for five minutes. Coach was throwing like, you know, coach was throwing. And that was their team. Okay, Jazz, JT, Jen, Chris, Anatan. That was their team. The other groups were on defense, playing real defense. And their team was up to bat. We set the clock for five minutes. They had five minutes to score as many runs as they could against the defense. So they could bump when they want, hit when they want. And then we just kept scoring. So it's all about competition. And so that's just an example of kind of a, a team practice plan. Any questions? I'm going over. I'm going to get in trouble. Any questions? Okay, two things. Number one. Please come out to our practice. I invite you all to come anytime. Just give me a call though, because our times change, especially with the weather, and our formats change. If you want to see a very offensive practice, and maybe for some reason we've hit a lot and we're going to do more defensive pitching that day, I, I would want to let you know that. Most of the time we do everything every day, but there are days where we do change it up. Okay? And some of you already got this from last night. If you're interested in a sport, softball specific strength and conditioning DVD, I have one for you here. They're $30 online. We'll do it for $25 at this clinic. Credit card's fine, cash check. Um, but you can do every exercise at the field. You don't need a weight room, extra equipment, anything like that. So there's speed drills, there's strength drills, 
They're all video um, core drills, so if you want that, I'll just, I'll be right here, but if I have to leave, I'll be right outside the room, okay? Thank you all. Good luck this year. Good luck. Do you need a softball bat? Do you want to save $30? Softballjunk.com is offering an additional $30 discount off the price of all non-sale softball bats on their website. That's right, $30. So the next time you buy a bat, go to softballjunk.com and enter the code FPTV30 during checkout. And wham, you just put a cool $30 in your pocket. Welcome back. Now that last short clip, now that was my daughter Amanda, and she was telling you about my website, softballjunk.com. Make sure and write down the code number FPTV30, because when you buy a softball bat on my website, you can enter that code at checkout and save yourself $30. And you can use the code over and over and over. It's a great deal. You just need to remember the code, and that was FPTV30. Now, if you enjoy this show, I ask you at least check out my website, softballjunk.com, the next time you're looking for softball equipment. Now, if I offer a competitive price, well, please buy from me. It's a great way to support what I'm doing here. Now, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and please tell your friends about the Fast Pitch TV show. And make sure that you take a look at my website, fastpitch.tv. So until next time, this is Gary Leland saying goodbye, and thanks for watching. This show is a member of the Fast Pitch TV network. See all our shows and blogs at www.fastpitch.tv.